Let's talk about some of the latest news in open source and Linux. I want to first start out with Nginx rejecting a pull request that would have added dark mode support to its default error pages called saving millions of eyes dark mode support for Nginx error pages. Now this was rejected as a change. A lot of people love that dark mode and this proposed change would have just added a simple meta color scheme which would have set light and dark. That way it would adapt to users browser or operating system dark mode settings. The problem, have you ever been peacefully browsing the web at night, clicked on a link and suddenly bam, a bright white and jinx error page blinds you. It's like getting hit by a flashbang in CSGO, but in real life without warning. And of course, a funny meme and go figure it's not in dark mode either. When you meet a programmer who codes in light mode, my eyes. Anyways, the conclusion here, one line of code has a game changing effect. This was very sensationalized, but the decision from Nginx was pretty much unanimous with users quick to dismiss it as such here. Why does this look like an advertisement? And please do not merge this. And the original submitter of the merge, if there's an actual technical reason against merging this, I'd be happy to hear it. Otherwise, rejecting a harmless standards compliant improvement just because of wording seems counterproductive. And as they kept pushing and pushing and pushing in order to try again, done, Nginx ultimately declined it, stating that the default error messages are meant to be minimal and administrators can configure their own custom error pages if needed. For those of you who don't know Nginx, or some people pronounce it Nginx, it's a high performance web server and reverse proxy server used to handle HTTP requests, load balancing and caching. It's widely used on the web to serve websites, APIs, and is a very common proxy for backend applications. I use it quite a bit for my web and API implementations. And I personally think this one was a silly one. Regardless, we'll see if this comes back around at some point. I thought it would just be a little funny to cover it. For Rust and GCC developers alike, a new, a major Rust update has been made. Patch 145 improves GCCers Rust front end. The highlight here is the Polonius Borrow Checker, which enhances memory safety and Rust capability, which we get the first of four patch sets updating the Rust front end for GCC. The key changes here are going to include the Polonius Borrow Checker, which improves Rust safety management in GCC, FFI and Rust Crate support enhancing capability with already existing Rust libraries, Rust installation requirement GCC now temporarily requires Rust for building the front end, inline assembly support inspired on how C front end handles assembly, and other core library enhancements for better attributes, negative traits, derive macros, and more. Hi everyone, this patch set is first of four similarly sized patch sets aimed to update the upstream with our most recent changes to the Rust front end. We plan on upstreaming small patches every week up to the release of 15.1. The first set's main change is the addition of the Polonius borrow checker to the compiler, as well as all of the infrastructure required for FFI and interacting with Rust crates in general. As such, an installation of the Rust programming language is now required for building the Rust front end to GCC. As a reminder, this change is temporary and we are working hard towards supporting enough of the language that we can bootstrap our own requirements. As in my previous video, Linux and open source is gradually integrating Rust, including front end systems now. And until now, Rust relied on LLVM via the Rust C for compilation. This update means that developers can now develop and compile Rust with GCC, which provides an alternative increasing which compilers can be chosen from, which is exciting. So this is great for developers who no longer are limited to LLVM based Rust compilation. They get more choices. There's better Linux compatibility now as integration in GCC will help it fit into more Linux based workflows. We're seeing growth in Rust day by day. Let me know what you think about this in the comment section below. Let's continue on to some great and big, big news. But before we do, make sure to smash that like button if you enjoy these videos. Also, don't forget to subscribe below. YouTube can get finicky and you wouldn't want to miss another video like this. And nearly after 13 years of development, GIMP 3.0 is finally released. As mentioned in a post here, GIMP 3.0 is released. People throwing up their hands in the air as it introduces numerous enhancements that are going to help the user experience, including new functionality, which is super exciting. And now on the website, you can officially download the stable release of GIMP 3.0. For those of you who weren't using the stable release and some of the RC or release candidates, you wanna make an update ASAP 
because you can finally use the current stable version, GIMP 3.0. As this free and open source raster graphics editor, which serves as an ultimate alternative to proprietary software like Adobe Photoshop, you can do things like photo retouching, image composition, and GIMP supports all sorts of various plugins and extensions, allowing for customization and extensibility. The coolest part is it's available for lots of distributions, including Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And a great read is the GIMP 3.0 release notes, which states after seven years of active development, we are proud to announce the next major release of GIMP, GIMP 3.0, while the original focus was on updating the newer GUI library. This release is packed with many new features, enhancements, and usability improvements. While we can't cover every single change from 2.1, we can highlight some of the biggest ones as you start exploring. And some of the top ones here are a modernized user interface transitioning over from GTK2 to GTK3. GIMP 3 offers improved UI scaling and high DPI display support, also enhanced support for tablets and touchpoint devices. It also has non-destructive editing now. Users can apply filters and adjustments without permanently altering the original image, allowing for a more flexible and reversible editing workflow. They also have enhanced text styling, including an updated text tool, which enables on canvas editing with features like outline, shadows, bevels, and more. Also, they've enhanced the file support. In GIMP 3, it expands compatibility with various file formats, including the PSD export, and support for BC7 DDS files so that it has smoother exchanges with other programs. It also has improved, which this is the one I love the most, layer management. Now you have the ability to select and manipulate multiple layers simultaneously, which definitely streamlines complex editing tasks. And there's much, much more that you can read on here on the website. I'll put a link in the description below so you can check this out as well. What a big deal. All you GIMP users rejoice. Let me know in the comment section if you're using GIMP. Either way, super excited to give it more of a shot now that it's in a stable release. Hopefully it doesn't take a decade to get to the full release. Only time will tell. A new patch series expands Rust support for the Linux kernel for the HID human interface device drivers. This is going to enable developers to write Rust based drivers for peripherals like keyboards, mice, touch drivers, and monitors. One key focus here is the USB monitor control class which is going to allow Rust written drivers to manage things like backlight controls on displays. For example, for the Apple Studio display or the Pro Display XDR, AKA more Rust in the kernel after the initial work for the Rust abstraction for HID device drivers development. Hello, I am a hobbyist developer who has been working on a project to create a new Rust HID driver and needed core abstractions for writing more HID device drivers in Rust. My goal is to support USB monitor control class needed for functionality such as a backlight control for monitors like the Apple Studio Display and Apple Pro Display XDR. A new backlight API will be required to support multiple backlight instances and will be mapped per DRM. The current backlight API is designed around the assumption that of only a single internal panel being present I am currently working on making this new API for DRM in parallel to work on the HID side of the stack for supporting these displays. Now it's exciting to see more people getting involved in kernel driver work. We need more open source developers. Of course, there's gonna be fragmentation concerns as trying to introduce this new Rust code into predominantly C-based Linux kernel is going to take a bit of rework. Although it's in a very specialized portion of the kernel that's talking about support for Apple Studio Display and Apple Pro Display XDR. I don't think many people are using those. Anyways, some interesting development in the rest part of the Linux kernel for HID drivers. And Breezy Desktop is finally available for beta. Now an open beta enables users with XR glasses to create multiple virtual monitors projected to their environment. It is an open source slash paid model, and it makes some people frustrated with the fact that it has a paid aspect to it but it's open source in nature. We're gonna be talking about the XR virtual workspace library for Linux. What's cool about the Breezy desktop is it can help you use virtual desktop environments for gaming and productivity in Linux using one of the supported XR glasses, which includes the Virtue One, One Light and Pro, the TCL Ray Neo from model NXT Wear, S and S Plus Air 2, Rokid, the Max and Air, Xreal Air 1, 2, and 2 Pro, not recommended though. And Xreal Air 2 Ultra, again, not recommended. The XR Linux driver is a big deal as it is innovation and integration of XR into our desktop environments. For those of you using XR, 
it's a pretty cool project. We can finally get into virtual workspace environments using Linux, and it enables immersive, productivity-focused workflows where you don't need physical monitors. Now, the biggest deal here is the paid model controversy, which raises discussions about how open source monetization should occur. It has a paid model after using Breezy for two months, you get a trial, but then it costs $10 a year or $25 for a lifetime. This of course frustrates some community members, but understandably is done so that the project remains funded. This marks Linux's entry into the XR space on open source platforms and is awesome. And here's that payment supporter tier structure. They also have a different structure as well called the productivity tier. And this is based on a monthly, yearly, and lifetime commitment where you can pay $5 recurring monthly, $50 recurring yearly, and $125 if you want a lifetime subscription. Anyways, let's get past the subscription model here and show off some of the desktop. Here's a brief clip with some XR glasses. It's quite trippy. As you can see, they have nine monitors set up, or I guess you should call them really just like workspaces. Anyways, it is pretty cool to see how this has come along and what you can do with this. You can imagine there's a lot running, although it's kind of funny. All they have is displays and they show a weird number of displays. It says up to 11. I don't see 11 displays, but whatever. It's cool that you can look around. Not sure how many people can actually use this. I would pretty much get a headache almost instantly trying to look around and seeing multiple displays like that. I'm pretty good about using two as that's my normal setup and anything more than that starts getting a little confusing to me. Let me know what you think about the XR extended reality display environment called Breezy Desktop. Have you used it? What's your opinion on the paid slash open source model? Love to get your thoughts. And now I wanna talk about some development that's a little bit controversial. The Bcash FS, which is a copy on write file system for Linux, has been the subject of controversy within the Linux community multiple times. As a developer and main maintainer has submitted large code changes labeled fixes during the stabilization phase of the Linux kernel multiple times now, which has raised doubts even for Linus Torvalds himself, the creator of Linux, stating back in April 2024, if you thought Bcache FS was stable already, I have a bridge to sell you, which is kind of funny. It's a little poke there, highlighting the doubts of Bcache FS readiness for production use. And later on in the year, an inappropriate communication between Kent the main maintainer and some of the code of conduct committee led to a temporary suspension, which created a mixed response. Anyways, Kent's back at it with Bcache FS change Btree WB assert to runtime error. We just got a report for a fairly interesting bug. We just had a report of the assert for Btree in write buffer for non write buffer Btree popping up during the 6.14 upgrade. 150 terabyte file system after a reboot, the upgrade was able to continue from where it left off, so no major damage. But with the 6.14 about to come out, we want to get this tracked down ASAP. And we need more data if other users hit this. Convert the bug on to an emergency read only and print out the B tree, the key itself, and the stack trace from the original write buffer update, which did not have this check before. An interesting bug is all hands are, are on deck to try to find this as this is an important bug to catch as seemingly Bcache FS does not know why this is occurring. As Bcache FS is designed to ensure data reliability, unresolved issues in the Btree write buffer could jeopardize the integrity of stored data, especially in large scale applications like we're talking about here. 150 terabyte file system. That's that's pretty big. System stability here. We're also concerned that the kernel level assertion failures are going to lead to system crashes and unexpected behavior. This bug really needs to be found. Otherwise, user confidence may even go lower with the Bcache FS for Linux broader adoption. Let's hope for prompt discussion and resolution of this bug. It's gonna be important to keep up the reliability and performance standards expected by users. I thought it was an interesting one to read about as we've had plenty of controversy before on how the testing occurs with Bcache FS. Anyways, a lot of interesting Linux and open source news covered today. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, make sure to smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe below. You're a true fan and you've made it to the end of the video. I appreciate you spending your time. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, 
flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.